Hey everybody, uh, I'm Brian Lindauer, I work for Duo Security. Welcome to our uh, first and hopefully a long series uh, of, of Duo Tech Talks in Austin. Um, tonight we're really happy to welcome HD Moore, uh, who you probably, many of you know personally, but uh, uh, if you don't, uh, he's the author of the, the Metasploit project. Uh, he is now uh, you know, at Atreides and uh, is here to talk to us about modern network discovery. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to HD. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. All right, so apologies for people here in Austin who have seen parts of this talk before, because it's kind of an accumulation of research techniques that have been building up for the last year and a half or so. Is there any solution for the echo? Okay. Uh, I guess I'll try to talk slower or faster. Which way? Uh, like, yeah, so quick intro. I work for Trades Partners, doing security consulting work. We do reverse engineering assessments, pen testing, all that fun stuff. Uh, Matt back there is my coworker. He's also awesome. Um, so Trades is great. They've been a lovely employer for the last couple of years, so almost three years now. Um, I also work for a Critical Research Corporation where I'm building a network discovery product. So I've been doing that for the last year and a half or so, and that's been a lot of fun as well. So this talk's kind of right between the line. It's a mix of uh, applying security research towards a not security uh, challenge, if you will. So it's kind of about finding interesting security techniques and then using those techniques to uh, do a not security task for the most part. Um, so you'll see a lot of overlap between security, not security, IT, and all that as part of this talk, but uh, that's kind of why it is what it is. Oh, and you know, prior, you know, previously worked on Meta's way for like 15 years. Uh, it's fun, I like it still, but I've got other things to do these days. And uh, the team across the street over there does a much better job of maintaining it than I do, so I'm glad they exist. Uh, so as far as discovery, like if you look at uh, building a discovery product or building or just doing network discovery in general, uh, the very first thing you do as part of almost any other task out there is doing discovery. So if you're trying to do backups, you're trying to um, do a vulnerability scan, you're trying to monitor your network, you're trying to look for performance issues, you're looking for open file shares, almost everything you do requires some sort of scanning, discovery, something first. And there's lots of ways to do discovery. You can do discovery using uh, passive network collection, you can go pull it from various machines using Active Directory, WMI, et cetera, um, or you can just listen to the network passively and wait for things to come by. So there's tons of different ways to go about doing discovery work, but discovery is usually a very critical component of whatever you're trying to do in IT slash security. Um, there are things in security that don't require discovery, but not very many of them. Uh, so in general, like, if you look at almost any of the security controls out there, the CIS, the uh, you know, top 20 critical controls, the very first one there is know what you have, and it's very inventory focused. Uh, we've kind of seen a uh, resurgence, if you will, of inventory focused security products in the last two years, and a lot of that's been driven by the external discovery side. People trying to figure out what they actually, which of their company stuff's actually on the internet at a given time. And there's been some great techniques to make that much easier these days, especially with certificate transparency and other ways through external discovery. Um, so this, talks about that a little bit, but mostly we're going to talk about internal discovery, which is everything inside this building, everything inside your home lab, everything inside your home office, all the stuff that's not directly exposed to the internet through an external IP. So that's kind of the focus of this talk. Um, if you're trying to do an external asset inventory, um, it used to be super difficult. You used to have to go, um, go download all the errand data or crawl through it, try to find all the various network ranges that belong to a given company. Uh, it was full of false positives. You'd find like customer assigned ranges that, that were actually stale and didn't match the right company anymore. Uh, you'd find host names that are kind of dangling out there that pointed to third party servers that weren't valid. So it was a whole lot of work trying to figure out what a company actually had exposed to the internet. Um, with the advent of certificate transparency, all that changed. So now, Every single time you register an SSL certificate, even before you do anything else, the world knows about that host name. That second it gets registered, it's great. So the cool thing about this is if you monitor the very public certificate transparency log, you can actually find things like WordPress servers being installed as they're being installed. You, know, you can actually hit the web server for WordPress before WordPress itself is even on the box as soon as the TLS certificate has been created. And you know the first thing you do with WordPress is you configure it. You set up the password, you log into it, you do all that. So you can actually erase a lot of ISPs stealing their own WordPress installs for their customers just by looking at certificate transparency feeds. Um, so it's that great of a source. So if you look at all the uh, companies now, they're um, selling you external visibility tools that tell you which of your stuff is on the internet, notifying you when a new hosting comes online. Every single one of them is using certificate transparency. Uh, the reason for that is that project became mandatory for anybody with extended validation certs and anybody using Let's Encrypt. So at this point, 90% of the internet is using a combination of either Let's Encrypt or an extended validation cert, and therefore they're all getting logged to CT as a requirement to be trusted by the Chrome browser and now Firefox and now others. So CT is amazing. CT will tell you everything happening on the internet as it's happening, and it's great. So use that. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, information on my speaker deck page that covers CT if you want to dig into some tools for it. 
Uh, do not use tools like SearchStream, which use a third-party API for it. You can directly query the CT head without paying anyone money for it, and don't pay a third party to be a proxy for your data. So by contrast, internal discovery hasn't really changed much. If you talk about internal discovery to IT, they're going to come back and say, oh, a ping scan, oh, or I can do SMP, or I can do NetBIOS discovery, or I can do WMI, or I can take my Active Directory domain and pull all my computers out of the, the, the AD. So the view of what discovery is, that was kind of the traditional view, is that we're going to go query something in an authenticated fashion or do a light ping scan. The problem is most internal IT discovery tools haven't really improved in the last 20 years. They'll do things like Nmap sometimes with some parameters. Most of the time they're doing ping, they're doing SNP, they're doing WMI, and if they don't have credentials, they just don't work. Uh, so those tend to be what the challenges are for internal discovery tools. Uh, we are starting to see some better tools for internal discovery, and for a lot of the reasons I'll get into in a second, and those usually are passive-based. So they're pulling things like DHCP logs, DNS logs, uh, they're pulling span port traffic, so they're capturing all the traffic going through the switches, and then they're saying, here's all your stuff. Uh, some other vendors, like Forescout, for example, they're pulling sw you know, your switches through SNMP and using that to identify all your client machines on the network as they're being registered and getting leases and things like that. So that's generally what the current uh, status quo is for discovery work. Uh, but the challenge is all these discovery features, they're really there to sell you something else. No one's building a discovery-only product. No one's doing discovery-only research. They're really doing discovery so they can give you the next thing. The next thing could be performance monitoring. It could be a vulnerability scan. It could be something else entirely. But generally, they're trying to sell you something. Uh, a lot of the vendors I've talked to that have got excited about the discovery work I'm doing, they're excited about it because they need this for their onboarding. They need to build a tell client how much stuff they have so they can sell them more things. But everyone looks at discovery as this first step towards something else. And no one's really spending a lot of time doing just discovery. So I'm trying to change that. And this talk kind of covers some of the techniques we've been going into and some of the uh, research that's been going into making discovery a thing on its own that should stand alone that's actually good enough to be worth using by itself. At least I think so. <clears throat> uh, so discovery on the internal network has gotten really complicated lately. You're seeing folks deploying uh, software-defined networking. You're seeing all kinds of weird WAN deployments. You're seeing hybrid cloud stuff. You're seeing the beyond corp stuff where they treat the internal like the external. Uh, most companies, I believe, you know, Duo in particular has been a great champion of locking down your internal network by treating it like it's an external network. Like, there should not be an internal network. There should only be the network, and every machine should be hardened and locked down, and there is no special access anymore. So that perspective of having to harden every system, regardless of what network it's on, whether it's trusted or untrusted, uh, that means that your, your standard discovery techniques don't work anymore. You can't, you know, do a ping scan on a network when every desktop has the firewall enabled. You can't use WMI to query every box if you've got SMB disabled. There's all these techniques that we've been telling users to restrict and disable and block because it's a security risk, and now they're finally listening to us, now they're finally blocking it, and now we can't discover the network anymore. So <laughs> that's the trade-off, which is good. It's good that we're improving security, the downsides we're losing visibility. And the reason why a lot of vendors are now going after the passive discovery space for network discovery and for visibility is they can't think of any other way to do it. That's the only way that they know of to get data. And I'm gonna push back and say, we can still do it through active discovery, you just have to be craftier. So the challenge with active discovery, though, is that if you can't directly route to a system, if you can't like talk to it, you can't get any information out of it. And if it's firewalled off, you have to figure out what port or what other service isn't firewalled off to get information about it, or how to retrieve that information from a third party that'll tell you about it on the network. Um, for vulnerability scanning solutions, they're notorious for taking your credentials, your, your super strong, secure Active Directory password, your SSH passwords for your Linux devices and your, your BMCs, and then sending them to everybody in the network at once. So every time you run a vulnerability scan, you're giving your password to everybody really quickly. And if you have an attacker already in your network and they actually have a listener, they're running a responder or something like that, another utility, they're going to capture those passwords, they're going to steal your credentials, they're going to relay those credentials, they're going to take over your machines using your phone scanner's credentials, uh, using all of your internal tools. Now, IT discovery tools are actually worse. Most of those things use WMI credentials and they use the native Windows networking stack. So whenever um, they call the Windows API to query a host to WMI, they're just basically sending you the password hash for that user account and that service account. Uh, there's a well-known case of that, or it should be better known, Palo Alto user ID agent, for example, anytime you port scan Apollo Alto uh, firewall, it would try to connect back to you to, to figure out what you were. Like, oh, what users logged on to the machine? I see malicious traffic coming from this IP. Let me go log in and find out what user it was. But it was misconfigured that a lot of devices were actually uh, responding that way to the internet. So you would find people's Apollo Alto devices hanging on the internet. You port scan them with Nmap. They would then log back to you with an enterprise active directory credential with an like, admin password. And you say, thank you, Apollo Alto. I have credentials to your active directory from the internet. Um, so that was terrible. They mostly fix that, but a lot of the agents, a lot of the tools that are used for discovery all depend on the same technique. They all still use Active Directory credentials. They, they assume that um, they can safely log into anything that's on the network. And when you've gone to the Beyond Corp model and we're looking at things where security is more important internal as well as external, that doesn't work anymore. 
Uh, you know, as you start looking into other tools that depend on things like NetBIOS Discovery, SMB, they, they just don't tell you much anymore. What you'll see these days is most discovery tools will either say, I know exactly what this thing is, or I don't know anything at all about it. You have a very binary detection mechanism. It's either it's absolutely this window. pretty well. So if you can actually monitor either a central tap port or you can pull DCP logs or DNS logs or otherwise capture all the central traffic happening in your network, then you can do discovery just great. You can monitor it all. And there's really cool research happening in this space. You're seeing companies like uh, Senrio, for example, uh, they will look at the communication happening between different nodes on the network and be, from that be able to tell you what that device is. So they've got no credentials, got no way to log into the device, but they know because it's talking to this server at this interval with this frequency on these ports, it's gotta be this type of hardware device because it talks to the backend corporate server somewhere for updates. So they're using the fact that these things are talking to update servers on the internet to figure out what they are, and that's really cool. Um, the challenge of the passive discovery model though is if you can't sniff traffic for every one of your subnets, you can't pull these centralized logs out, you don't have any visibility. Um, and there's some other ways to get around that, like Forescout with pulling, uh, pulling SNP off switches, things like that, but it, it's really hard to get comprehensive coverage with a centralized monitoring model. So if you go back to actual discovery, um, most of the research that was really interesting in actual discovery work happened in the late 90s. You're looking at things like POF and, uh, what is it, like CNFP, KSO, Xprobe, all these tools that no one really uses anymore because MAP basically ate them all. All the techniques that these tools use have been incorporated into an MAP command line flag someplace, or they're just not that useful anymore and stop being used as a result. But essentially, all we do these days is NMAP, and there hasn't been a lot of research into how to actually fingerprint, actually discover things, because it's getting harder and more difficult. Just like vulnerability scanning got much more difficult as people started enabling firewalls, um, basic discovery work has also gotten more difficult as a result. So as a result of all this, the low-level fingerprinting techniques have actually gotten more relevant because when you can find out a tiny little bit of information about a host, you can say, okay, this is not just Linux, it's Android Linux. You know a whole lot more about it. You can actually tell, so a lot of what we're gonna talk about for discovery is how do you take really tiny little piece of information that mean absolutely nothing on their own and build up so many of them to get a complete picture of the network and actually build an accurate profile of everything on the network. Uh, and that's difficult. You can't just use each of those little pieces doesn't tell you anything at all. They're all kind of a pain to get, and you have to combine a whole lot of them before you really have a decent picture of what's going out there. So it's basically building a puzzle out of all the little network probes and responses you get, and that's hopefully what we'll dive into here in a second. Um, the one exception so far for uh, password discovery where that is widely adopted is a lot of the uh, um, home firewalls and small office home office firewalls. They've actually got built-in DHCP fingerprinting now, so they can actually tell you what each device is in the network based on the flags of the DHCP client when they go try to get an IP in the network. Of course, the challenge with that, just like the previous password discovery, is that if you don't control the DHCP server, you can't do discovery. So a lot of those devices don't work once you're outside the local LAN as a result. So if we want to do better active discovery, we're trying to come up with like, what are some techniques we can use to discover what things are that don't require active directory creds, don't require us to be credentials, uh, the accuracy should degrade kind of incrementally so that it's a gradient of accuracy. It's not just a yes, no, Boolean, I know what it is or an unknown. Uh, we need to be able to scan mobile systems, firewall systems, all kinds of stuff out there that is more common in networks today than they were before. So it's kind of like um, similar to vulnerability scanning. Uh, I don't know if anyone used Nessus back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, kind of watched the major shift between uh, vuln management around uh, 2008 or so really took a hard turn towards active, to authenticated discovery only. Um, it used to be that all the vendors, you know, all the major vendors at the time, Qualys, uh, uh, Encircle when they were still Encircle, um, you know, Rap7 of course, other folks, uh, Tenable of course, before pre-Tenable when they were still Nessus, they all fought very hard to remotely identify vulnerabilities using really crafty research techniques. So for things like the, you know, Blaster bug that send packets in a very particular way that cause things to get leaked back and then from that they can tell that the patch hadn't been applied. Same thing for uh, MSO8067, like the MSO8067 scanning research alone was more impressive than most of the exploits. That was much more harder to uh, safely scan for that vulnerability than it was actually exploited. Uh, that's also very similar with some of the remote desktop work that's happened lately. There's ways you can fingerprint and scan for it, but they're actually so difficult just to figure out how to do the scanning that you're almost better off just running the exploit and see if you get a shell. Uh, and so that's kind of where things are, is that vulnerability scanning um, became such a research intensive task that most vendors in this space moved on to doing authenticated scanning only, where they can use things like SDB credentials, Active Directory, et cetera, and they just basically pull the list of packages and tell you what's patched and what's not. There are still some vendors out there doing a great job of uh, unauthenticated uh, vulnerability research-driven uh, scanning, but uh, not as much as they were before. It used to be almost all the scanning was like that. Now, um, the research-driven unauthenticated scanning checks are very much the minority compared to the rest of it. 
Uh, so what we're trying to do is take the same techniques that vendors did for unauthenticated vulnerability scanning and apply that towards network discovery and asset dis um, inventory. So if we can fingerprint a device using all these same kind of small information leaks and small bugs, they're, they're probably security issues at some level, but at the same time, if you get enough of them together, you can turn it into an actual like real fingerprint. So we're gonna try to do that. We're trying to apply like deep research towards lots of weird little techniques and then use those to build a good profile of a device. Uh, so my favorite discovery technique, bar none ever, is NetBIOS, like the 137 UDP, boring old UDP service that's on every single like Samba and NAS device, every Windows box, every Mac OS server out there. It's amazing. You get so much information out of one unauthenticated packet. Uh, a single query in this thing uh, will give you back the MAC address, it'll give you the host name, it'll give you the group name. If you then query it a second time saying, okay, great, your host name is blah, tell me about your interfaces, it'll give you a list of every IPv4 interface on that device, unauthenticated remotely through UDP. It's amazing, and you can spoof it, and you can do all kinds of cool techniques by spoofing packets, causing them to bounce around and do like route tracing, all kinds of cool stuff. So the UDP 137 is as dumb and kind of old as this protocol is, it's amazing. Like you can do really great segmentation testing for PCI pen tests in you know, car data holder environments by trying to figure out, okay, which of these machines in this network has a second interface that'll let me into a network that's more sensitive than the one I'm currently in. And you can do that just by doing one quick UDP sweep, and that's it. They have to log anything, it's super easy. It's still like the best technique today to figure out how to get from point A to point B when you're doing a pen test and one of those networks is isolated from the others. Um, so Metasploit supported it for years and we never really just talked about it because we just used it. Uh, but Shodan added support for it about a year or two ago and there's also some other utilities out there for it. Uh, here's an example of kind of what it looks like. Um, I released a little open utility for it called NextNet, which will do this. For, and essentially, you just run it against a subnet. It'll come back with your host name, your name, your network list. And that network list is all the interface of that device. Now, the cool thing about that, it's on by default, it works by default. If you don't, haven't turned your Windows firewall on, this will work across almost every corporate land ever. It's great. Also, every coffee shop. And of course, you get a list of interfaces. You don't get the net mass of the subnet size, but you at least get enough information to know that it's multi-homed and maybe what network it's part of. Um, it'll also do things like enumerate your VPN adapters. It'll enumerate your uh, virtual machine adapters, for things like VMNet for VMware Workstation, for uh, VirtualBox. Those all show up here as well. And based on the patterns here, you can actually tell which virtual adapter it is. So if you see two 182.168s back to back like that in that particular order, then you know it's definitely VMware. So you can actually pull all kinds of information just out of this one super easy thing. And that's not without even going into the host name where you can see what type of device it is based on these particular character sequences. You can say, okay, it's a desktop and it's probably Windows 10 based on the sequence of characters and this frequency. You can also look at the domain and say, hey, it's not domain joined, so I know it's actually an undomain joined desktop. So it's not part of the normal corporate LAN. Otherwise, you know what domain it was part of. And then finally, you get the MAC address. The MAC address actually tells you how old the thing is if you actually dig enough deep, dig in deep, and what vendor it is. So now you know it's an Apple laptop, manufactured in the last two years, it's not joined to the corporate LAN, and it's running you know, all the stuff you get out of one packet. It's amazing. So I don't want to go too much further into this, but this is the type of information that is a gold mine for unauthenticated discovery. Anything that's on by default, tons of information that's very light, that is non intrusive. We want as many of these things as we can possibly find on all the protocol. Isn't that just the paper? I'm sorry? Oh, net, sorry. Uh, those are a list of all the IPv4 interfaces on that host. So the machine's coming back and saying, I've got this IP and this IP and this IP and this IP. And it comes out, so normally when you query through NetBIOS, you say, give me your name and your Mac, and it comes back with all the information. But there's a second query you can do where you ask the machine again, what IPs you have for this name? And it'll go back, it'll kind of sort of resolve it internally and give you a list of all the IPs related to it. So you're, It does, yeah. So the, the 212, 192, 168, 175, and 146 here, these are actually VMware VMNet IPs. That's your uh, VMNet host only adapter and your VMNet uh, NAT adapter. And then over here, you've got your actual real corporate LAN IP, 0 0.50. And then you've got a, a fourth interface, which is currently not connected to anything. It's probably a wireless NIC that's not currently connected to anything at all. As you can see, it sells 169.254 configured on it, the auto, the auto configured address. So you know this is probably a wireless address that's a wireless adapter that's currently not connected to a network and therefore unconfigured. We get all that out of one packet, so it's great. Uh, yeah, so that's the kind of stuff we, that we, that's the gold mine. We wanna get as many things as we can. Um, so SNMP, as boring and terrible as, as this protocol is, there's still things out there that run it by default. So most real things on enterprise networks don't support SNMP v1 and v2, or at least have it turned off if it's enabled. You're using v3 these days, which have really long passwords and all kinds of other fun stuff we'll get into. But every printer out there has got v2 on it. Your actual printer driver, if you get a new brother printer, a new Samsung printer, and you install just the standard crappy drivers that come with it on your Windows laptop, your Windows laptop will now start sending SNMP v2 queries to everything on the network all the time, trying to figure out what's going on. It actually uses SNMP to figure out what the ink level is. It uses SNMP to figure out what the toner, like, the toner levels are on uh, the uh, laser jets, for brother printers at least. So all this stuff still uses SNMP version two, and as a result, every printer out there has version two enabled. 
And what talks to printers? Well, all your corporate desktops, all your laptops, anything that's actually currently has a driver, has that printer installed on it, is constantly pulling that printer. But that printer has SDP version two on it, and it's collecting things like, let's say, the MAC addresses and its ARP cache. So we can now use those printers as a way to basically snitch on everything else in the network and tell us about everything else around it by pulling its um, SNP OIDs and using that to get information about machines that we otherwise can't query directly. So if we want to find the MAC address of a firewall Windows desktop in a remote subnet, we don't have to scan the Windows desktop, we just have to go query the printer. And the printer will tell us all about it. Um, so that's uh, Optimist SMB Discovery does lots of cool things. You can do uh, anything with low, you know, SMB enabled, you can do the ARP cache, you can find neighbors, you can dump the VLAN and MAC tables from switches. We'll talk a little bit later. You can find firewall devices that don't talk to you directly, but you can find out that they're there because the SDP of another, the SDP uh, ARP cache of another device tells you about them. Um, and it's inconsistent, but when you find it, it's amazing. So all you need is really one of these things in the same broadcast domain as the rest of your targets, and it'll tell you about everything else. So a quick example of dumping the ARP cache, you can use SMP walk for it, OID dumps you the IP address and the actual name. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so if you wanted to enumerate the ARP cache of a remote subnet and the devices in that subnet are not talking to that printer. So let's say there's a remote printer two hops away from me. So normally I can't just go ping them or ARP scan them or anything like that. They're firewalled off, they're not telling me anything. How do I get a printer two or three hops away to actually tell me what the MAC address of this device are? Well, if they've got the driver installed, if they're online, if they're talking to that printer, they'll be in the printer's ARP cache. We can just pull them out like we did previously. But what if they're not? What if they haven't talked to that printer? Then they won't be in that printer's ARP cache because the printer and them aren't chatting in the network, therefore it's not gonna be there. So how do we force them to talk to you together? Well, that's where you start doing things like spoofing traffic. You can now spoof traffic from the printer on one subnet to all the hosts in the same subnet, and as long as none of your layer three stuff uh, does egress filtering on that path, it'll actually respond back to all those hosts, and it's part of that, it'll query it, it'll do an ARP request for it, then populate the ARP cache, and then dump the ARP cache for you. So you can actually uh, remote ARP scan a network by spoofing traffic. So one example of this is using Nmap with a send IP option. You sp uh, specify the spoofed host, do an ICMP scan, and there you go, you can actually dump the entire ARP cache remotely, multiple hops away, which is nice. Um, the challenge though is this does not work if you, the device between you and the target uh, that's routing your traffic ha is in a Linux router. By default, they've got RP filter on, RP4 equals zero. Those disable reverse path filtering that'll actually prevent the spoof packets from crossing um, those links. Um, so if it's a Linux router, it'll probably get dropped. If it's not a Linux router, it's like your standard, there's like a layer three switch or it's your standard kind of like embedded consumer hardware uh, router. It's probably going to pass the traffic just fine. So, uh, that doesn't work. So let's say you do have a Linux router and it's blocking your traffic. How do you still do it? Well, you can use other protocols. You can find protocols that will force one device to connect to another device. And in doing so, they do the ARP request, therefore they populate the ARP cache, and then you can get the ARP information. So uh, one example of this is UPnP notify requests. Uh, the Cisco guys uh, did a great uh, bit of research on the Talos team about this, where you send a UDP packet to a device telling it to notify another device, and the, UDP, the device that you queried will then go ping that other device for you. So you can cause remote subnets to talk to each other back and forth and populate all the ARP caches for you between the devices and then dump the ARP cache again, and then you've got the ARP cache list. So we're trying to find ways to make devices talk to each other in a remote subnet that they can't control directly. Uh, so this one works pretty well. Um, you need at least one UPnP enabled device in the remote subnet to do that though. Um, another way to do it came up with uh, Ricky Lachey of uh, Trendmico did this. Uh, he found a way, he said you can use SIP invites and SIP invites will cause the same thing. If you've got a bunch of corporate um, uh, VoIP phones in that subnet, you can use SIP requests to those phones to make them call each other all the way around. So each phone's calling the printer and vice versa, and that's gonna populate the ARP cache from whatever device you can pull, and then there you go, you get it all over again. So all these things basically let you populate a remote ARP cache and then dump it the rest in the P by having that one device that'll narc out the rest of them for you. If you, for incoming phone calls, it does a SIP invite. So it, it doesn't care where it comes from. Um, yeah, and it'll respond back to the SIP invite with the, the ringing response or the NAC response, but you can also spoof that. So you can either spoof it inside the UDP packet itself where you say the URI to connect back to, or you can actually spoof it in the, the actual traffic you send, but that won't cross routers that do reverse path filtering. So you can either spoof at the IP level or you can spoof at the UDP payload level for that. And both generally work. Um, the second one's required if, you, if the Linux device is blocking the uh, uh, spoofed IP though. Uh, let's see. So, um, most SMP uh, tools are really slow. Like if you ever like or done an SMP walk on a device and you hit enter and you're watching it go like line by line by line by line, it's taking like 20 minutes to enumerate the SMP cache of like a, a printer that you know credentials are in it somewhere, but you're waiting on that thing to spit them out. It's way too slow. Um, a lot of this is some of the really old devices are version one only, and version one uh, SMP walk. 
basically just does one request at a time, one element at a time. And, just, and each time you're doing that, you get a full network timeout, network a round trip. So I give you this number, is the last one, okay, go get the next one, and so on and so on. Um, one cool thing about SVB though, SVB version one though, is you can still stack multiple requests into the same packet. So no tool that I know of actually does this, but if you actually just shovel tons and tons of SVB queries into the same packet as multiple OIDs in your request, the servers will respond back with all those responses at once. So you now have a 15x speed up on all your SVB queries. So if you're trying to query, let's say you're trying to um, send a packet to the entire internet and you're writing some SNMP field you want to get and you want to use SMP version one for it. Now instead of just querying one field, you can now query 15 different fields all at the same time with one packet. Um, it's also really good for DDoS. So if you want to cause a really large response to come out of these devices from a spoof target back to your DDoS victim, then you'd also do something very similar with a stacked query. You get a huge amplification vector or response as a result. Uh, the only real limit is the max response size in, uh, configured in the SNMP daemon itself. You can do something similar with SNMP version 2 with a stacked get bulk. Uh, get bulk by version 2 is generally faster. It'll actually walk the table as multiple elements at a time. But if you're trying to query multiple tables, you can actually query multiple tables in the same packet, but just by putting multiple bulk requests into the same uh, SNMP packet. Uh, and again, I, I do not know of a tool that actually does this, like open source tool at this point, uh, but I know that it works well. We've been using it by default in Rumble for a while. Um, so the only thing it doesn't work on is IBM I series, like old you know, three, Z370 mainframes. They don't like this very much, but they don't follow up at least. They just don't respond. So another example of that, you can see like, we're stacking multiple get bulk to the same thing. Each of those returns an entire table of results. So you also get massive replies to these things. So you can also use it for DDoS or anything else too. Um, so finally, uh, does anyone here, has anyone here actually used SMB version three? Okay. Yeah, no one likes version three because it's horrible. Like it has like 15 freaking fields you have to configure just to do it. And it gets even worse. With particular Cisco with catalyst switches, for example, if you want to query a different VLAN, you create a different context for each VLAN to even query it. So it gets super complicated to query. No one likes version three because it's a huge pain in the butt. Uh, security guys tend to like it because well, if, you, if they don't have to configure it <laughs> because the minimum password length is like eight characters long and all the keys are fairly long. So no one's really going to guess your password very often with SMB version three. There are some big uh, mistakes early on in the protocol development where you could do like a null HMAC and bypass the location. Once those initial bugs were fixed though, version three has been mostly ignored by attackers for the last 10 years. Um, so let's fix that. Let's make attackers <laughs> tear apart version three because it's a lot of fun. Um, so there's no default credentials version three. Version three, um, what happens is when you first query the server, it'll come back with a context ID, which is like a long, opaque, like engine ID. And then you have to authenticate to the server using one of the methods it supports. And uh, there are different models of authentication. You can have no priv, no auth, priv, no auth, priv, and auth. And you can have a privacy key, authentication key, and they're both separate. So you end up having two separate passwords for SMB version three. One that's either uh, you know DES or uh, AES, and there's a couple of other protocols now. And then for your uh, for your privacy uh, settings to encrypt the data, and then for authentication side, it's usually MD5, SHA, and there's a couple other techniques available as well uh, for newer devices. But essentially, you have two different sets of passwords, and at that point, the only thing that the attackers have really figured out how to do well with version three is enumerate usernames. So you can give it a username list and just bust through, and it'll say, okay, these devices all have the same username. Um, as you can say, oh, this one's got a network username, this one's got a network username, they're probably managed by the same people. So early on, before I really got too deep into version three, what I realized is that username enumeration is really good if I was trying to figure out whether a router was owned by the ISP or owned by my customer during a pen test. So if I didn't know whether like, it was ISP managed or customer managed, that was a great way to tell by which usernames were configured on it, just by brute force and username list in V3. So that was a good starting point, but there's a lot more you can do. So the version three response is this Harley, this gross vomit of hex that comes out of it, basically. Um, there's a couple cool things that come out of it. So uh, you get a global data, max message size. So this thing will actually spit out a 64K reply in response. So if you can set it a whole bunch of queries, this is a huge amplification vector. For version three is like your best DDoS protocol on the planet now because of how much amplification will come back. It'll send fragmented IPs and everything too. This has a much higher message size than SNMP version two and version one. Um, if you look into the message authoritative engine ID here, this long, ugly string, um, this has some pretty cool fields in it. One, it's got an enterprise ID, which is the OUI IEEE registration number. This will tell you what vendor it is. So it'll tell you whether it's APC, Cisco, Broadcom, et cetera. So you already know the vendor just coming out of that one little byte right there. It's awesome. Or those two bytes right there in that field. The next thing you can get back out is engine ID format, engine ID data. And the default for Cisco, Juniper, and a lot of other equipment is MAC address. So it's actually going to give you the MAC address unauthenticated across the network in the V3 pre-authenticated reply. So it's telling you the vendor, it's telling you the MAC address. And from that, you can find all kinds of other cool stuff. You can figure out how old it is, you can figure out what type of device it probably is based on heuristics. Uh, and then you can dig down a little more. There's some other stuff that comes out of here. Engine boot time, engine invalid engine count time. Um, invalid engine ID count is really fun. That tells you how many times someone's tried to authenticate to it via version three and failed. So it's almost like a bad auth counter. 
And if you want to see if someone's trying to hack your network, well, scan it all once, look at that number, and then come back a week later and see if anything else touched it. Okay, has anyone even tried to authenticate to version 3 in any of my devices at all? Now, the, the saddest thing about this is I did an internet-wide scan for version 3. I pulled these counters off almost everything on the internet, and I came back and rescanned them all two weeks later, and very few, like, almost none of the counters had even moved. Like, no one is scanning version 3 on the internet. Like, it's very sad. We need more hackers out there. What is this? Lazy, you know, so anyways, hopefully people will scan this more because you get a lot of really cool data out of it, especially the Mac address and the uh, enterprise ID. So the MAC address, though, is not necessarily just the last six bytes or the first six bytes. It's encoded all kinds of funky little ways. So depending on the vendor, Cisco and Juniper are pretty straightforward about it. But as you start getting down to the weeds of all sorts of weird V3-enabled network hardware out there, they encode the MAC address in the most bizarre ways. So you'll see this like almost like an EUI 64 V6 address for like Link Local, where they do like three bytes and FFFE, then three more bytes. In this case, it's actually four bytes and FFFE, then two more bytes, then another random byte in the end, because why the hell not? So there's all kinds of stupid encoding methods. You'll see ones where it's like almost the last six bytes, but off by one, it's off by two. Other times when the MAC address is actually the very front. Sometimes you'll see the MAC address encoded as a hex string. Um, so it'll be a text string encoded as hex, and that hex turned back into hex again, and then encoded there. So it's double hex encoded, stuffed into some other random field. So it's, it's super annoying. Um, but for devices that don't return the MAC address, uh, they don't have the type of MAC. There's another one that's really common, that's NetSNP, the open source NetSNP daemon. Uh, that has what's called a random ID in it. And the cool thing about the random ID, one thing we'll talk about a little bit later, is that uh, it tells you a unique identifier for that host. So if you're scanning a huge subnet and you collect all those random IDs from all your version three unauthenticated net SNP demons, you can figure out which ones are the same box, which ones are not, just by seeing which of those IDs line up. So if everything's got a unique ID, they're all unique hosts. If five of them have the same ID, it's probably the same box with multiple interfaces. Hooray, now you've got a multi homed up box. You've identified this machine as multiple IPs, and you know what those IPs are just by correlating its unique ID off this protocol field. So we'll talk more about uniqueness, uniqueness detection and its use case in multi-home detection going forward, but it's just a, a neat little tidbit from that protocol. And this is all pre-authenticated, all one packet. So you get a lot of information out of this as a result. Um, so moving on a little bit, if you're trying to figure out what machine on your local subnet will route traffic out to the internet and which gateway it uses to route that traffic out of. So let's say you've got, um, you know, corporate network here, a bunch of laptops on it. You want to figure out who here is using a VPN to get, to get out of the network and who's actually going through my corporate proxy, my corporate Cool techniques for that, and I was playing around with this stuff back in 2005, and it's changed a little bit since then. So I want to talk about a couple of them real quick. Um, super easy way to do it. Uh, you set up an internet listener, just waiting, listening for any traffic, um, and then you spoof the internet host. So in, from the internal network, you send traffic from the internet, but on the local LAN, to every local machine. So every local machine then responds to the internet, even though the, it's not, it never really got a request from the real internet facing IP, it got it from you locally. It still responds to the internet as if it was a local request and it's respond out using its default route for that IP. So if you have a different default route, like a VPN adapter, an AOL dial-up back in the day, all that stuff, those packets are not gonna come out a different interface than when you sent them on. All you have to do is sit out there on the internet, wait for the packet to come back in, and you know exactly which egress gateway that internal machine is now hitting you on. And there's some techniques for that where you can identify which host it was as well. Um, the sequence number in TCP is 32 bits long, which is great, because IPv4 addresses are also 32 bits long. So you can actually stuff the destination IP into the TCP sequence number, um, and then when you listen for the responses on the internet side, all you do is take that, that the ACK number and that packet that you got, the SYN ACK or the reset ACK, subtract one from it, and now you've got the internal IP again. It's a really easy way to bounce a packet through and figure out where it came from. So you can do like a trace request using that uh, sequence number as a tracer. Um, it also works for ICMP, so you stick it into the ICMP payload, you spoof a ping packet from the internet to everything locally, and then they all respond back out to the internet with the ICMP data in it, which then tells you the initial encoded destination. So that's how you can find internal machines that are routing out of not your corporate network. That's right, so it's looking at the source IP as it translates out a different gateway, yeah. We're trying to find a NAT gateway that's not the one that we know about, yeah. Uh, so it helps you find things like uh, rogue gateways, people using VPN adapters that you shouldn't, someone's got like Nord VPN installed at work, um, things like that, or there's other use cases as well, so uh, one that's happened more recently to me personally is that I realized my, uh, my cellular card or my laptop was on by default and routing traffic out the cell link instead of out of the corporate Wi-Fi. I was like, I don't even know how that happened. It just got stuck in a mode where that became the default route. And I found it because I was like, hey, how come I'm getting packets out of this random 23 dot whatever IP now? Um, so the challenge with those techniques, though, is that uh, stateful firewalls like Linux, they don't like to route a SYN act out to the internet when they didn't see the SYN coming in the first place. They'll realize the TCP state's not correct. They'll also do the same thing for ICMP. They'll say, hey, I see an ICMP echo response coming out of this gateway, but I don't see the echo request coming for it, so I'm just going to drop it because there's no state for it in the, the NAT table. Um, so what you can do instead is use all those techniques we talked about before with like NetBIOS, DIP, with uh, SNMP, and now spoof those UDP payloads internally and do the exact same thing, and the firewalls pass them just right through. They don't care about protocol state for UDP. 
So if you're an example of this, you can use ZMAP, for example, give it the NetBIOS Pro Packet, scan your entire local subnet from the internet, but actually locally on the same local LAN, and all those machines will actually respond back to the internet with a uh, NetBIOS ACK. And the source port will be 137, the destination will be whatever the random source port of your scan was. And you can set this, like let's say there's a restriction that you can only talk to port 53 UDP or something else, you just set the source port of your scanner to be that source port here, and it bounces back out that way. So there's lots of ways you can make that work. If you can catch it, right? So if you can guarantee that you get the right, so source port 137 should usually tell you on that internally. Uh, but the, the trick here is like if, the traffic is going through a different gateway, like uh, a WAN adapter or Wi-Fi or a VPN, you won't see the response at all. But this is a good way to figure out which, how many of your machines locally are actually routing out of a different gateway than one you know about. Um, so that's a quick example of using ZMAP for that, but all those other techniques we talked about before, SNMP, um, uh, SIP, uh, UPP Notify, those all work as well. Um, the UPP Notify guys did a really cool job. They, uh, when they're working on the research, they use that to leak the IPv6 address of consumer devices on the internet by pinging their IPv4 address with the UPnP notify to a v6 resolve hostname instead. And so all these v4 systems would get a ping packet saying, oh, go contact this hostname. They resolve the hostname, get a v6 address, and then connect to it with their v6 address, and then leak their v6 address to the person doing the scan. So they're able to correlate all the v4 addresses with all the v6 addresses using that technique. But it also works for internal networks here. We're able to do that to identify rogue egress gateways. Uh, so. Next thing I'm talking about, you guys probably know how DNS works, but basically you, you generally don't talk to the authoritative DNS server. If you're trying to resolve, you know, duo.com, you're not gonna go uh, resolve, you're not gonna go straight to duo's DNS servers. You're gonna ask your local caching resolver, it's gonna ask is upstream resolver, it's gonna go ask the root server, the TLD server, the domain server, then eventually get to duo server, and it's gonna cache a lot of the steps, so it should speed that up. By the third or fourth time that's happened, your local resolver is gonna go straight to duo server. But generally there's a lot of steps involved there. So um, the resolvers, though, actually leak a lot of information upstream about your domain. So there's a thing called uh, uh, DNS minimization that's become a trend lately for some servers will actually not leak the full domain name to the root server of the TLD. They only leak it to the final one. But by default, everybody in that chain knows what host name you're trying to resolve. The full host name, not just the domain. They know you're trying to resolve mysecretsite.duo.com. They don't necessarily just see duo.com or com in that case. So DNS minimization is a great technique to, to do that. So if you're going to enable the minimization of your network, that's a great way to expose, prevent data leaks. But there's lots of other data leaks that happen out there besides just the name itself going out. Um, there's something called the eDNS, eDNS0 client subnet extension. This is how um, uh, Google does GOIP locations for DNS replies. So when you query 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, uh, Google's DNS server will then look at the source IP the request came from, staple that out of the DNS packet, and send it up to authoritative reserver with your IP address on it. So it's actually telling the authoritative DNS server for the domain you're querying what your real subnet is. And it's not giving the full IP. They're going to mask off that last byte because that's that helps, right? <laughs> um, they're actually um, the reason for that is to help the authoritative DNS server find the closest response for you for the DNS name. So it's for like uh, geo uh, geo load balance DNS, but as a result, it ends up leaking your client sub information to third parties. So we can abuse that. Uh, we can actually set up our own custom resolver. We can set up our own box on the internet, our own custom reflective DNS server and domain name, and then we can spam eDNS zero queries, everything internally, locally, inter or sorry, spam DNS queries, everything locally, and if any of those end up stapling an eDNA a client subnet extension onto the query packet, we'll get that echoed back to us as part of our custom DNS server. So we did that, um, and you'll see things like this. You can get a list of, you can actually find out the, the real DNS resolver that queried the authoritative domain will get echoed back in the DNS response for the helper domain. So this is one of the things we've got to, a uh, public open source tool for running your own DNS server. Uh, I don't want to get too, too into the weeds here, but definitely ping me if you want to set up one of these. They're kind of fun. Um, they're useful for all kinds of fun stuff. You can do, um, you basically can create a DNS trace route. You can do all kinds of fun stuff by encoding names into the subnets you query. So you basically send like a big DNS hex encoded request to a fake subdomain at a um, custom resolver uh, domain. And as it bounces all the way up, it'll record a lot of information, echo the responses back, and tell you the entire path it took as part of the DNS reply that you get back from it. Uh, so I don't talk. I don't want to use up too much of your time. This stuff gets a little. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so um, we'll set up a basically a black hole subdomain. So I'll call it like blackhole.duo.com or something like that. Uh, so anytime you query any like www.blackhole.duo.com, what's going to happen is you're going to query your local resolver. It's going to query the upstream resolver. It's going to say, okay, who ha who is the name server for blackhole.duo.com? Oh, it's this IP. Let me go send that request to this IP. But that IP is not a normal DNS server. That IP is actually running a rogue DNS server that sees this request coming into it and then does various things with it. So for example, if you query it for a special name that says, you know, 
get my resolver address dot black hole that do com, then it's going to say, oh, you want me to tell you the IP it's coming from. So that DNS server is going to look at the IP address where its actual DNS request came from, the upstream resolver, not your IP. And it's going to code that back into the packet as like either a CNAME field or text or something like that and send you back the reply. You're going to get the reply back saying, oh, great. I know that when I query this local resolver on this local network, it's actually going upstream to this ISP. That ISP is then querying that server. So you can actually tell what the upstream resolver is of your local DNS servers. So if you have a, uh, a random consumer electronics device in the network and it's got a DNS server running on it, you can ping that box through DNS query and realize it's actually using some Chinese DNS server. And the only way to find that is by doing these types of queries. You can find upstream resolvers. That's one of the things like uh, some of the tools I work on do by default. They actually show you the DNS resolver list and it uses a custom domain that we host to do all that stuff. Uh, but we've also got um, the custom DNS server there. It's like checking your IP address for DNS, except for instead of it getting your IP address, it's getting your upstream resolver's IP. So it gets to the, it gets to the intermediary, intermediary IP, which is otherwise hard to discover. Because it uses um, a... Yeah, I mean, That's a good question, I don't know. I need to look, I need to, do they tell you who your resolvers are, or do they tell you what your IP address is? Oh, yeah, okay, exactly the same. Yeah, they're, they're doing the same thing. They're, they're, they're leaking back the resolver source IP in their response. So that, exactly the same technique. Um, uh, you can for the IP address, but if you want to do things like echo back the client subnet extension, like some of the other fields are harder to get back out. Yeah. Do they have an EDS echo server like that? That's great, let's start using Google for it. I don't want to this thing anymore. Sweet. Um, so we used to use this stuff for like Tor demasking, so for like the Nebraska pen pal or play pen case, uh, they ended up using uh, some software I wrote called D, uh, Dcloak back then, which also used uh, uh, DNS resolver leaks as part of the fingerprinting process. Uh, so to, to do, we'll skip some of the stuff. The, the main thing to, think, to keep in mind though is anytime you're using this kind of crazy DNS stuff, you have to uh, um, mutate your query every time, otherwise it gets stuck in the cache. So each time you send the query, you have to use a random key and then XOR or something like that. You have to do something to make sure it doesn't get uh, cached in the server. Otherwise, you'll get the same response back every time. You can't just keep pulling it. Uh, TTL works as well, but you don't usually minimum TTL that most DNS servers would respect is like one minute. So if you're querying a whole bunch of things in a row, you probably want to like not wait a minute between doing so. So instead, if you can give it like a, you know, a, put a prefix on the end of it or stick another name in front or XOR encoded, those all help with uh, breaking the cache basically. So I'll skip through the DNS stuff a little bit. I'm happy to chat more about it if you like. It just goes pretty long. Um, here's an example of uh, echoing back the uh, client subnet extension in a hex name as a CNAME field as a response to it. So just to, here's like an exact, a real domain name that I set up. I think this domain, this top of the domain finally expired a couple weeks ago, but a uh, big long hex encoded string, which is XORing the whole thing. And then it comes back saying, here's the CNAME value. And if you dig that out, it'll actually say it's a slash 24. Here's the actual source IP. Just an example of the set the leaks. I think Google's planning to kill off uh, eDNS zero client subnet extensions just because they are an information leak. And they, for a while, they did it for every request. Now it seems like they're only doing it for like maybe five or ten percent of the request. Uh, and my guess is more people will stop doing them soon too, just because they leak information that's surprising to people. Most people don't realize your IP is being leaked to their upstream resolver. Oh, so okay, so moving on a little bit to MAC addresses. So we talked about a lot of ways you can get MAC addresses before, like uh, you know SNP, of course, but also things like NetBIOS and local ARP subnets, ARP caches. Um, there's lots of cool things to do with Macs, but Macs are actually more than just Ethernet. Macs also cover things like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, a fiber channel, all kinds of stuff use the same prefix and the same registration numbers as Ethernet. Um, so there's not a lot of like really good fingerprinting databases out there for MAC addresses that are public. There's some uh, some AV vendors with their little home routers and stuff, they'll actually create a MAC address database, but it's pretty rare for those things to get shared. Um, there is one exception though. There's a, a project called DeepMac that they looked at every OUI registration on the internet for the last uh, 20 years and mapped it. So every time like IEEE would register a new prefix, they would download the OUI to text file and they'd save the record and they'd keep track of the differences over 20 years straight. That's amazing though, because I actually called IEEE and I'm like, guys, like, where's your where's your diff in your database? Oh, we don't keep one. Like, they have no record, they have no historical data at all for any of their OUI registrations. And I was like, how do you guys not have like a backup someplace? Like, I just wanted like, a, I wanted a 10-year-old copy of a particular one because I did, it was missing in the data set. I was trying to backfill it. Like, oh, we don't keep records doing that stuff. So the entire OUI registration for enterprise IDs, for MAC addresses, they do not have historical sets for it. They only have the current one. And if you track the changes, it's not just like 
cosmetic changes. They like will randomly reassign it between companies. They'll change countries on stuff. Like it's a mess. That is a dirty database. Uh, even though a lot of people don't really think about like the vendor look up for Mac adders, the back end of that thing is squirrely. Um, Inner Archive actually doesn't have the text files. I went back and looked at it. They're, they're, they don't mirror the OEY to text files for the registrations for some reason. Um, the people who that did have it though, uh, so Wireshark and the previous to being called Wireshark went to Ethereal. If you go dig it out of all the CVS archive or the old CVS uh, code repositories, they've actually got CVS disks each time they updated it about once a week or so. So you have to go through and grab every revision of those files out of the Wireshark archives and then the, before that the Ethereal archives and then cross-reference out the DMAC archives. So we did that. So we took the DMAC stuff, took the Wireshark stuff, the old Ethereal stuff, and we went through a bunch of old text files and archives we could find. We finally built kind of a comprehensive database. So after all that junk, we finally have, well, it's, it's now public, but it's basically on uh, um, github.com slash HGM. I think I have a URL, to, URL for it later on, HGM slash DMAC dash tracker. And that is a full JSON database that's fully normalized. It has daily updates. That includes the last 20 years of history across both those projects. We track where it came from and changes and all that. So if you ever want to know exactly where a Mac address came from, we spent way too much effort on it, so you don't have to. Uh, so uh, MDNS is fun. It's also known as Bonjour and AVAED. Um, it's often overlooked because no one really cares about it, uh, but it tells you a lot of really cool things, especially for Apple devices. Apple devices will tell you exactly what model they are, including like how big the screen is, how many Thunderbolt ports it has, uh, the OS revision. Um, this thing's, well, if this thing wasn't being live streamed, I'd tell you about Spode. But uh, yeah, there are, there are some bugs out there where certain uh, products will expose the logged in username as an MDNS field on Mac OS X for some reason. I don't know why. For some reason, this one particular agent by a company from an employee here um, will uh, uh, yeah, do that. So I'm not going to go into too many details. Hopefully it'll get fixed soon. But basically, you can use that to do a username scan across a huge subnet. But like, find me all the machines that Jaisal has logged into or something like that. So you can do it that way. Not to pick on Jaisal, but um, yeah. So. Uh, Bonjour is great and MDNS is great, but it gives you back the, the OS X versions, the MAC addresses a lot of times. And I actually just tell you the MAC address text field. For some reason, the MDNS. I don't know why. Most printers will actually tell you their MAC address through MDNS. Uh, you also see a list of V4 addresses, V6 addresses, because part of the MDNS uh, service entry, it's not just the port number, it's also the address. It'll actually tell you which IP to use. So as a result, you can actually use MDNS to identify multi-home devices by looking at the number of IPs they return in the list. You can find a system that's on a Wi-Fi and on the wired network. You can find a system that has a Bluetooth LAN adapter or is tethered to someone's mobile phone, all by looking at the return responses of MDNS. Um, so quick example of that, here's like a Mac Mini. You'll see like uh, there's a text record that comes back from the DNS query that's Mac Mini 8,1, OS version equal 8. So we know it's pre-Catalina, we know it's running the 2018 version of the Mac Mini. And then you see all this other junk. So you actually get the V6 adders out of it, and the V6 adders also has oftentimes an encoded Mac in it. You'll get the developers Mac minis who know the logged in username as well, just from that. That's actually a different bug, but or because Apple likes to use the host name in all their fields, it's a great way to figure out the username as well. We know it's running VNC, we know it's got SSH enabled, we've got, it's got SMB, it's got Samba, it's got the Net Assistant. So we have a whole lot of information here just out of one MDNS lookup. Uh, some other examples for MDNS, so you can see whether it's got the remote desktop enabled, you can see whether it's an IP camera, or whether or not it's got a particular service advertised. Um, Android phones actually leak their host name out through uh, MDNS by default. So you'll see Android phones on a local wireless subnet that normally you port scan these things, there's nothing on them. It's a really boring phone. Like Android, Android devices are the worst ever to scan because they're so boring. But a lot of them will actually expose their host name through um, MDNS. And you can see how many other Androids are on the same network because they first tried to register through DHCP-1 and Dash 2, sorry, Android, the Android Dash 2, the Android Dash 3, the Android Dash 4. So if you see a device coming back saying it's Android Dash 3, you know there's at least two other Androids in the network too, not just that one. So that's a neat little information leak. Um, uh, well, yeah, so this is the, um, the reverse DNS IP here is coming back out. So the actual response from DNS is a pointer record, and the pointer record is the pointer style response followed by the host name. So if this may not be the IP you query, this may be an IP that it's telling you about. So you can actually find a leaked external IP out of that that way as well. Um, you'll see encoded MAC addresses here. Uh, Sonos devices, for example, their host name itself contains the MAC address in it. So just by getting the host name to kick back to you, you can then decode the MAC from the host name. So the goal of all this is how do we get as much possible information out of this field as we possibly can? And this also applies to other fields that most people don't really think about. If you look at the default uh, certificates for most network devices out there, whether it's um, you know Chromecast, whether it's a router, whether it's like a Palo Alto firewall, uh, a Fortinet box, they expose tons of information in TLS fields. 
Now, they may not expose it in the main port 443 web interface, but they often expose it in a secondary one, like port 8090 or 8443 or things like that. The default certificates expose all kinds of fun stuff. So you get the serial number for Fortinet. So for example, if you want to RMA a Fortinet device, and, or you want to get access to Fortinet support, you can just scan that network and get the serial number real quick and use that to call in with it. Like, they love to expose their serial number in every possible field they can, and the TLS certificate's a great way to get that. SonicWall tells you the internal IP addresses directly inside the TLS certificate on a higher port. Um, IDRAX will actually tell you the service tag. So the cool thing about this with a Dell IDRAX, um, I think it's the IDRAX 6 and at least the 5, sometimes they'll come back with a full service tag in the TLS cert for one of the higher port numbered web servers. Um, you can then take that service tag, go to Dell.com, look it up, it'll tell you all the specs of the machine, how much RAM does it have, what OS is it running, all that stuff is great. So you get a really uh, huge pile of information out of basically a tiny little field in a TLS certificate. Um, so we've been adding uh, TLS finger fingerprints to the recog project. We added about 125 different fingerprints for the TLS issuer and TLS subject fields. And that's a big re, you know, open source repository that's used by Metasploit, Metasploit Pro, Nexpose. Um, so if you want to play with this stuff and you want to contribute back, we've got an open source repo. It's under BSD or MIT license that you can contribute this stuff to. Uh, and of course, you can go trawl the whole internet for internet data and then come up with fingerprints based on which ones are missing. Uh, so quick examples here, you can see like the MAC adders for Ubiquity routers are actually leaked out in the TLS cert. You'll see Synology, of course, we'll tell you it's a Synology box. You'll see. Uh, Oh, this is actually a fun one. Um, so this is a Google Chromecast on port 8090, and the first part here is the, the serial number. The second part, though, looks like a MAC address, but when you try to resolve it, it doesn't actually resolve as a valid MAC. It'll say the invalid MAC address, because there's a bit there that doesn't work, so there's no allocation for it. So what you do instead is you mask off bit two, so F8 becomes F8, and then you look it up, and it's like, oh yeah, it's a Chromecast. Um, but the only way you know to do that is by masking off the local, local discovery bit on it. Um, this actually tells you the, I believe this tells you the Bluetooth uh, MAC address, not the Wi-Fi MAC address, but just like most other devices, it's only one off in the Wi-Fi adapter. So once you have this address, you know the Bluetooth, and then if you mask off the last bit there, you also have the, uh, the wireless address for it too, and then you can correlate on the network that way as well. Um, let's see, Palo Alto gives you the, the a long, looks like an MD5 sum or SHA-1 sum, and then Chromecast also tells you the exact version of the Chromecast in the TLS cert as well. So as far as I know, that's the best way to figure out what a Chromecast is, is by looking at the TLS cert that it exposes. Um, I'm sorry this thing is so long. I've got like 100 slides, but we're not going to go that far. We're going to stop at 40, hopefully. But, um, so in addition to um, all the protocols we talked about that are kind of cross-vendor, there's some stuff out there that's like very vendor-specific. You'll see things like uh, the... Uh, Ubiquity access points have a discovery protocol on port 10,001 that leaks all kinds of really cool information. You'll see Synology has its own local protocol, Ubiquity, Netgear, et cetera. Uh, brother printers are the worst. They've got this horrible brain dead protocol used to find printers in the local subnet and the drivers constantly spew these packets out. So they're actually really useful for us. Some of them are broadcast only where once you're outside the local subnet, they don't respond anymore. But a lot of these like Ubiquity, um, you can actually hit from the internet. So if you search showed in for port 10,001, for example, UDP, you'll see all the Ubiquity devices on the internet that expose all this. And to give you an example of what that looks like, uh, you'll see the, the device name, the ESSID, all the IP addresses of it. You'll see the firmware fields. You'll see the, the MAC addresses of it, the full model name, all that stuff. This all comes back from the discovery protocol. So if you can find one of these things, this is great. You get all kinds of cool information from these devices with very little work. So if you're looking at how do I get a MAC address and you don't have layer two access, you're not on the same local subnet, and you're plugged in the same switch, you're not on the same Wi-Fi, it, may, it could be a couple buildings away, it could be on the internet. How do you find the MAC address? Well, you can look at version three, version three of SNP no auth, and pull it out of that engine ID field we talked about. You can look at version one, version two, version two with public community strings uh, for things like printers. For MDNS, you can pull them out of the name, and you can also pull them out of EUI64 encoded V6 addresses that get leaked out. Uh, all the device specific protocols. SSDP, actually, um, SSDP is a service um, discovery protocol built into UPnP. So if you have you know, universal plug and play stuff and it's doing ports and all that fun stuff, it usually has SSDP as the protocol as well. SSDP is neat because um, the way that MAC addresses get leaked in SSDP is very not obvious. Um, SSDP uses these long um, UUIDs, unique user IDs everywhere, or, or UIDs everywhere. Um, so it look like big long hex strings all over the place. Ends up that a whole lot of vendors like to take the very last 12 bytes of the UID and just replace it with the MAC address. So if you look at like a Roku device, for example, the last 12 bytes of the UID advertised through UPnP is actually the Roku's MAC address which is what they use as the identifier. So it's, you can actually do a UPnP scan, which is really easy, SSDP, everything lets you do cross-network SSDP scans. You can now remotely get the MAC address for all those devices, and then you can do all kinds of cool things with them. Uh, DSP hostname, of course. Um, the neat thing about DSP hostnames is that um, if you have a device like a, an Axis uh, camera or a Sonos uh, audio streamer, it'll when it's getting an IP address from the local network, it'll send its hostname to the DSP server as part of the registration. It's saying, DSP, you know, I want an IP address, my hostname is blah. 
the DNS server, sorry, the DHCP server often works with the built-in DNS server of the same device or your Active Directory DNS server or whatever it happens to be, and it'll update the local DNS record as well, saying, hey, the DNS record for this host is now Sonos dash this name. The great thing about that now is now it's leaking its MAC address into the DNS table. Now when you query reverse DNS, you get the MAC address for the device as well. So you can actually bounce those DNS, you can actually get the uh, large amount of MAC addresses out of reverse DNS for a lot of these devices because they register a, D, a DHCP host name with the MAC address in it when they boot up. Uh, even in cases where they don't, where you can't pull it out of local reverse DNS, you can pull it out of the local MDNS pointer response when you query it for its own IP address. So if you query an MDNS server asking it for its own IP, it'll actually leak back its own host name, which often includes the MAC address. So it's kind of ad nauseum. We just keep trying to find as many different possible ways to leak these MAC addresses out of them and then use those for unique identifiers and keep on going. Uh, I spent a whole lot of time in a dark room by myself, as you can tell, going through this stuff, trying to figure out how to leak MACs. Uh, but the products that are related to the MAC addresses, um, uh, I mentioned before the DeepMac Tracker project that's on GitHub. Um, that's updated every day with all the latest information from OUI. There's also the Mac Ages project. So the Mac Ages is actually built off Deep Mac Tracker. And what it does is says, let's go see the very first time every Mac prefix was registered, and we'll make that the very floor date. So we know if a brand new Mac prefix gets registered tomorrow, we know any device we ever see running that Mac prefix must have been manufactured after that date. Otherwise, it wouldn't, couldn't get the Mac just burned into it. So um, it sets a floor for when a device is manufactured. So the good thing about that is you can find out all the, you can find all the devices in your network based on how old they are. Uh, once you have the Mac address, you can say, show me all my devices that are more than, you know, three months old, or th sorry, three, even three years old. Now you know you can depreciate those assets and sell them off, because you've, you've already written them off tax-wise. You can basically go through and buy them again if you want to. So for folks who are doing, like, IT inventory stuff, they want to figure out what devices they can now write off, a great way to do that is now to look at the Mac address last eight, uh, age time, and then anything more than three years old, you know, is almost guaranteed. You can just go right off and buy something new. So that's nice. Uh, you can also tell how old it is and how unpatched it is. So if you see a device with a 10-year-old Mac address, you know it's this probably hasn't seen a patch in a very long time. Uh, so those are those two projects. Uh, could definitely use more help on the DeepMac Tracker project writing fingerprints. We want to do fingerprinting for things like uh, differentiating between different types of Cisco devices based on which prefix they use. Um, Cisco has been kind of terrible as far as like vendors for uh, reusing Mac address ranges. So if you do, uh, we pulled like 22 million Macs off the whole internet by scanning them with version three, version two, and so on, that BIOS, and cross-referenced all of them. Uh, Cisco overlapped Macs from new devices and old devices. So a device that was issued two or three years ago actually had a Mac in the same prefix range as one that was issued 15 years ago. So you, can't, you don't really get a lot of information from a lot of the um, Cisco prefixes because a lot of those ranges got recycled. Um, how yeah, they seem like you must have upgraded your equipment by now. I mean, or they've got a way to refresh it, but I'm, I'm guessing it hasn't bit them yet because no one's complained about having two routers of the same Mac, right? So, um, but it's wild, like seeing, like looking at something that should be unique and trying to figure out is it actually unique when you have enough data. That's it's been a really fun project figuring that out. And keep in mind, these are also shared between Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet, not just Ethernet. So you do have a lot of conflicts on across protocols, even not across uh, vendors. Um, yeah, so the idea is to match these against sub-blocks and have more precise Mac-based fingerprinting at some point. But we need a lot more eyes to help with the classification process. Um, hopefully we'll get some couple universities involved soon that can help us with kind of the, the brute force work of just going through millions and millions of matches trying to figure out what models to use to, to build these. Uh, so kind of finishing up, I want to talk about multi-home devices. Uh, if segmentation is kind of all the rage for security, you generally don't want to put your insecure stuff with your secure stuff. Um, if you're subject to PCI regulations for like CDE stuff, your merchant bank, your retailer with a large processing center, um, you have restrictions. Anything that is touching cardholder data has to be in this network, and even if not, has to be over there. Never shall those two things ever meet. Anytime there's a crossover between your unsecure network and your CDE network, um, that's something that has to be looked at very closely. There has to be multi-factor authentication. There has to be some other compensating control. There has to be logging. Um, there's a lot of jump boxes being used to cross over between retail networks from the CDE environment to the non-CDE environment. Uh, a lot of folks in the retail space actually have separate Active Directory trees just for CDE compared to everything else. And they have different users. Sorry, they've got the same user accounts, but they can't have the same password either, because that's also a violation. So there's all these various complications you have with keeping these uh, segments isolated from each other in those environments. Um, so if we can identify that a de particular device is bridging two of those networks, bridging a secure network and a not secure network, and we can figure that out through one way or another, we know that's a bad thing. We know we should go focus on that. Um, so we started playing with this recently. In the last year or so, I've done quite a few retail uh, CE tests, and we've been using multi-home discovery techniques to identify multi-home devices and then try to figure out whether that lets us into the CDE, whether can we actually break into the network using that path that we identified. And often, yes. So that's great. Uh, so um, some examples here, you can identify devices that are connected to a VPN. You can device, identify switches that are responsible for doing the segmentation. So 
a lot of folks in the pen testing and red team side, they often uh, will beat their head against all the Windows servers, Linux servers, like, dang it, okay, I can't get into that network, I need to be on this box. What they often don't realize though is that switch over there is actually connected to all the VLANs. You can pop that one switch, you get everything else. Like that's all you need, get to the switch and change the rule and allow yourself in. Add yourself to that VLAN if you want to, change your port mapping. Um, so once you get into the networking equipment, everything else falls down real quick. Like the networking equipment is way more important to security than a lot of people realize. And a lot of folks treat it as not a standard target. Either they're worried they're gonna knock it over or they just don't know very much about it so they don't really beat on it too much. Uh, but we do see that networking equipment is often overlooked in, in pen tests, especially for segmentation based assessments. So all those things we talked about before, UPnP, MDNS, NetBIOS, SSP, they all leak back IP addresses. And if they leak back an IP that's different than the network you're on, you just found the mobile home box. So if you're on 192.168.0. something and that box came back and told you it also has a 10.0.0.1 IP address, hooray, you just found a device that's technically a gateway. If you can find a way to break into that system, you can get that machine to bounce packets into that network for you, that's now a proxy, it's now a path into that network that you didn't have before. So those things are super important. Um, the flip side though is sometimes you can identify a whole bunch of boxes and none of them will leak multiple IPs. But you can find out that some of those machines are the same system after all. So you can scan the 10.0.0 network, you can scan the 192.168 network, and if you look at the results and correlate them together, you realize, hey, this box has the same random field as that box over there. It's the same system, that box is bridging it. We have to be able to pull out the unique identifiers and do the correlation to figure that out. Um, yeah, so um, the goal of this stuff, of course, is how do you find pivot points during a red team attack where you're trying to find a way to break into a network you can't get access to? And how do you find things are accidentally being bridged or have different egress um, gateways than they should? So here's a super simple example. This is like my home network. I bought a new laptop because I need a new work laptop. Um, the one I have here is kind of does not build quick enough. Um, so my main corporate network is 192, or my test lab base is 192.168.0.0 slash 24. This box is a little Windows desktop, crappy box. It's got two VMnet adapters on it. Same, same ones we looked at before, no big deal there. But this is really the main network. Um, I was scanning this, the network earlier and I realized, hey, what the hell? This laptop actually has a different network attached to it. It's got this external IP, 2642.62.0 slash 24, which I should probably not live stream on YouTube because it's probably still connected right now. Uh, so we'll see what traffic comes in. Uh, so there's now a random device on the internet bridging into my corporate network that I didn't know about until I ran this scan about two hours ago. I was like, well, crap. <laughs> so now this device is now an inadvertent bridge from the internet into my network that bypasses my, my normal NAT gateway coming off of this, this network here. So it doesn't show all the... This is only showing multiple home devices, it's not showing the entire network infrastructure, but normally all my traffic goes out of a NAT gateway over here, and this is definitely getting around that. So going a little bit further, um, if you look at not just my crappy little test network here, but you look at like a real corporate network. So most corporate networks have like the big, you know, the star topology or edge and leaf and tree and all kinds of cool fancy networking terms talking about how they link their switches together, how they have their core routers and their backhaul and all the fun stuff. I'm not a networking guy, most part, but they get complicated and they, and they look really pretty. When they draw a diagram, like, ooh, it's like stars and flowers and looks awesome. Like, those network charts look amazing. And then you look at like, what happens if you treat the network, what, what happens when you look for multi-home devices instead and you highlight all the external segments in red and the green and the internal ones in green, you get this vomit graph. So this is actually the real network. <laughs> this is actually how subnets are interconnected with this particular uh, corporate network. This is a, like uh, SMB, it's kind of a thousand person company uh, they're pretty small, you can't really see any data on here on purpose, but the idea is like all those red subnets, those are external facing machines. That's actually a publicly reachable internet subnet connected to a device, those little black dots, that's also connected to an internal subnet or another external. And the one thing that jumps out right away is everything is connected. There's almost nothing on this graph that's not connected to something else through at least one hop. Like you're getting the, forget the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you got two degrees. Kevin Bacon's everywhere. Like you can't get around him. So uh, basically from any of these red, points on the internet. If you can break into the device connected to that IP address, connected to one of those red subnets, you're now directly in the corporate network, you're on the corporate network one way or another. And if you're not directly on it the first time, you just go to the next hop, the next hop, the next hop, the next hop. So um, you don't even have to get very like bloodhound graph theory of this to realize something's really wrong with this network. Uh, and actually, this is actually a pretty decent environment. If you looked at the topology graph of this network instead, it would look perfectly clean, it looked great. All their routes look good, their VLANs look nice, everything looks nice, like it's all locked down very clearly. But when you look at the inadvertent bridging between systems that are connected to multiple segments, it turns into this crap show. Um, and we presented this, or I presented this to a client a while back saying, hey, uh, so we did your PCI pen test and this is what it actually looks like. They went, nah, like, no, no, for real. Like, we can break into this box and use that to break into that box and then get to your thing over there. And they go, uh, we'll have to look at that. Like, but, but look, <laughs> like, so it's, it's one of those things where um, the realistic response is, yes, this device bridges that, that, and that, but that's actually the NAT gateway. That's actually the site router. That's supposed to be there. It's supposed to be bridging the internet to the internal network. It's actually our site's, you know, egress point. Um, 
but it does give you an idea of how interconnected everything is and how complicated things are and just how fragile things can be from a segmentation standpoint. So zooming into this graph real quick, you'll see that uh, one of these so little orange guys there are switches that are kind of cross-connected all over the place. A little uh, hexagons, those are just assets that are multi-homed. And then this guy right here, this is one asset in particular that's bridged to like one, two, three, at least three external subnets, four external subnets, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven internal subnets. So this is just a random uh, Soho router that can be exposed out there that they're using to connect multiple pops together. And as a result, um, it has, I think they're using VPN site to site links and all these other external segments are actually the VPN site to site IPs. But I don't know what's going on, but this seemed like a bad idea. So you break into that one little box there and you get access to pretty much the entire corporate network. If not through the first top, then through the next one. So this kind of lines up with uniqueness. If you're trying to figure out what's unique about a host, um, most of the IT world looks at MAC addresses or serial numbers as the primary method of uniqueness because there's really not much else out there you can use for it. You can use hard drive serial numbers sometimes, but there's really not much out. Host names are okay if you got them, but host names are problematic for other reasons as well. Um, so what actually represents a system? Is it an IP address? Is it a cluster? Is it an IP, you know, TLS? Um, there's lots of other challenges with trying to figure out what something actually is and whether it's unique. Um, so if you have a wide enough view of the whole internet, how many unique things are actually out there versus how many things are not unique? So a core switch can have dozens of interfaces. A router can connect to tons of different networks. Uh, clusters can include lots and lots of like backhole networks, interconnections, and so on. Um, so if you start looking into things that are definitely unique, most of the time Mac address is unique. There's definitely some exceptions, but uh, and then anything that's random on a device, that's like a either boot time randomness or a persistent random field you can query. If that's on multiple machines, obviously you know it's the same machine. And then shared attributes, of course. So. Um, as you start digging through this stuff, the ones that we landed on as being the most reliable indicators, yes, sir? That's a good question. Um, so um, any device? Yeah, um, so Android, Windows 10, I think iOS will all randomize your Mac, um, the last bytes of your Mac address by default um, when you join hotspots. And I think those work the way they should be. So you just don't see them very often. They, they're still persistent for, I think, the reboot or something like that. So I think Windows 10 will hold on to its Mac address for at least a day, maybe more. Um, and I think Android will hold on to it until a reboot or like a week or something like that. Yeah, the, the Mac, uh, for IPv6, it uses a static link, like Slack is the, the term for it, S-L-A-A-C. That's how it uses to allocate its IPv6 address. And those ones, because it randomizes the Mac address, and then it boot, and when you open it up, it allocates a new v6 based on your Mac address, then of course it's random. That makes sense. Well, I think you can, can, you can change the timing on those as well. Um, but yeah, just to wrap up real quick, so the, the things we identified as the, the most unique attributes you can pull from a device over the network are the um, MAC address, of course, when, you can, when it's not on our blacklist of bad things. And then through SMB, the DNS computer name field that comes back from an SMB authentication negotiation, during the auth channel, it'll actually send back a, a challenge. That challenge has the host name in it. That host name is a great thing to correlate. One thing that was surprising for us, but worked really well in practice, was the TLS certificate for a remote desktop. So remote desktop has, uh, for all the network level authentication, um, all the remote desktop systems that support network level authentication, they actually have an X509 certificate you can pull out of them. And that certificate is actually only good for, I think, like eight months or six months. It's a really short-term certificate. And if, the, if, if that machine is brand new, brand new, you knew exactly when it was built, when it was manufactured, because that's the beginning date of the TLS certificate. You actually get some additional information about its build time out of it as well. For machines that are more than eight months old, you can't really tell because they cycle the certs. But what we can do is use that fingerprint of that TLS certificate to uniquely identify that host, no matter where it is in the network. Even if it changes IPs, even if you can't get the host name, as long as you talk to RDP, you can know that it's it's definitely that box again, at least within six to eight months, or cycles. And of course, the random IDs we talked about before. So I know I talked to you off, but here's an example of uh, scanning all of Iceland. So it's about 4.3 million IPs, and then analyzing all of them at the same time to figure out whether which devices are the most unique. So here's one where uh, this particular router, since we scanned 42 million, or 4.2 million IPs across tons and tons of slash eights, uh, we correlated this router across two different slash eights. We found out that it's on 178, it's also on 213, and we realized that because it had the same unique ID across both fields. So we knew, even because we scanned enough stuff, we were able to correlate it that this thing's actually bridging multiple networks. Same thing down here, this thing crosses uh, three slash eights, and this one actually covers like 209 different IPs across like five different slash eights. It was huge. So. Um, this is all public information. You can basically, the way that we uniquely identify these was by pulling either MAC addresses out of it, SMB random IDs, things like that. So that's why we know that these, these things are all the same IP or all the same device. Um, 
And oftentimes the DNS, the name here is actually coming out of reverse DNS. So the reverse DNS for that router may be something totally different on one interface versus another, but we know it's definitely the same router. So um, kind of next steps, uh, if you want to collaborate on this stuff, some of the projects we're working on there, GitHub, Recog project for fingerprinting, the DeepMax stuff, um, the DNS tools I talked about before and the Rumble tools repo. Um, and if you want to collaborate on fingerprinting stuff or just talk about the stuff, definitely reach out after the talk. And thank you very much for your time. Uh, I have 60 more slides and we're not going to show them. Are there, if there are any <laughs> questions, I you can raise your hand and I can pass you a mic. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot.